Welcome back to The Defiant Explains, where we create comprehensive weekly tutorial videos diving deep into DeFi projects and show you exactly how to use them with a step-by-step -step guide. Today's video was commissioned by Vertex, but it was researched and created in-house by The Defiant team while adhering to our standards of objectivity. It's also a great help with the algorithm, so I'd really appreciate if you could hit the like button and turn on notifications for more explainer videos like this one. Today, we're exploring Vertex and paying close attention to the problems they solve in the DeFi realm. The fall of FTX has undoubtedly shaken trust and challenged the concept of centralized platforms. On the other hand, decentralized exchanges remain popular as they offer transparency and self-regulation. But how can decentralized exchanges or DEXs live up to the attractive liquidity levels provided by their centralized counterparts? Vertex Protocol tackles this problem by introducing a number of innovative solutions such as cross-margining, near-instant order executions, no MEV, and vertically integrated products. But to understand what these mean in practice, we first need to understand why decentralized exchanges have trailed behind their centralized counterparts. The catastrophic demise of FTX in November last year erased around a quarter of the global crypto market's value. The contagion spread quickly and fueled by the prior failures of Terra, Three Arrows Capital, and Celsius, the dominoes continued to topple. Soon enough, BlockFi and Genesis Trading were also facing insolvency. Each of these names was bound together by a commonality. Their centralized governing structures, which offered double-digit earn yields to attract users, engaged in reckless trades to keep afloat, and they mismanaged customer deposits. Pre-2022, the crypto space was arguably considered a series of decentralized and self-custodied systems. This not only included Bitcoin as sound money, but financial services as well, known as DeFi. All that being said, the reason for CeFi dominance is quite simple, convenience and deep liquidity. The latter is defined by two factors. Firstly, tight spreads, which is the minimum difference between a bid and an ask when trading. Then we have low slippage, the minimum difference between the expected and the settled price. Centralized exchanges offer both because they don't really rely on users to supply the liquidity across numerous fragmented liquidity pools, hence their deep pockets. In contrast, decentralized exchanges or DEXs rely on smart contracts to lock in user deposits or liquidity pools. Traders can then tap into their liquidity pools for various token pairs, such as the WBTC to USDC or ETH to USDT, without the need to match existing orders. In other words, DEXs rely on the popularity of their platforms to attract more liquidity providers to enable efficient trading. Additionally, on-chain transactions are as fast as the blockchain network allows them to be, which is another problem that doesn't exist with centralized exchanges. And that's where Vertex Protocol steps in to resolve this imbalance between centralized and decentralized exchanges. But how can this actually be accomplished? So let's take a quick look at the key advantages of centralized exchanges before diving deeper. Like Uniswap, Vertex is a decentralized exchange protocol. However, it uses a hybrid order book automated market maker or AMM. Now the job of every AMM algorithm from Uniswap to PancakeSwap is to track and pull the liquidity coming from the separate liquidity pools supplied by the users. Then the AMM algorithm delivers the available price for each token pair trade depending, of course, on the status of liquidity pools. In other words, decentralized exchanges allow users to trade between each other on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. But through the AMM algorithm, this is quite different from the traditional order books. Trades are listed on each side of the ask and bid wall. Sell limit orders are represented as red, while buy limit orders are green. Contrasted and visualized, these ask and sell orders measure the volume on each side of the supply and demand wall, otherwise known as market depth. Now, the distinct advantage of a traditional order book is the very creation of a limit order in the first place. This is the price a trader sets to either commit to buying or selling an asset. So centralized exchanges can execute these orders automatically when the order reaches the specified price. Additionally, large centralized exchanges, which handle enormous volumes, already have liquidity to execute these trades instantly. This is critical to avoid slippage. Traders can then see the order book volume on both sides of the trading equation, which also gives them a hint about the direction of the asset's price. And now that we understand the difference between order books and AMMs, it's going to be a bit easier to understand the Vertex protocol. So as we mentioned, it uses a hybrid order book AMM. And to become as efficient as a centralized exchange's order book, 
a DEX would theoretically have to address the following four key points. The first is low latency. Placing and executing trades in fractions of a second, as well as viewing the result. Decentralized blockchains inherently introduce lag because all the transaction blocks have to go through a consensus algorithm across the network's nodes. Second, scalability. It is the main obstacle to mainstream adoption, which is why Ethereum heavily relies on layer 2 scalability solutions such as Arbitrum and Polygon. This is in addition to the volatile gas fees for executing transactions. Then we have MEV, which is minor extractable value. Taking advantage of smart contract inefficiencies such as order of transactions in a block, miners are incentivized to find extra profits. Now this is typically run by bot scripts and it's considered a malicious but unavoidable type of behavior. And finally, we have front running. By the same token, both miners and validators can use the knowledge of the upcoming trades to execute their own trades first. That happens ahead of the original ones. So what does the Vertex design mean technically? Vertex aims to address these vulnerabilities with a hybrid approach by using on-chain AMM with an off-chain order book. This is a two-layered approach in which the off-chain order book is dubbed sequencer and it runs on top of the AMM algorithm. Specifically, the Vertex AMM matching engine is running on Arbitrum as fully on-chain, which means that all trade settlements are also executed on-chain. This is Vertex's default state. In turn, the Vertex sequencer, called Edge, stores the non-executed orders to then be relayed to Arbitrum later for execution. Connecting to Edge, Vertex facilitates Application Programming Interface, or API, to plug Vertex's protocol into external exchanges to execute trades. That happens in addition to checking asset prices, placing orders, and checking account balances. This API is the hybrid aspect of Vertex. It enables lightning fast performance at 10 to 30 milliseconds, which is comparable to the fastest centralized exchanges like Binance. Visualizing Vertex's on-chain AMM with the off-chain edge sequencer for order matching looks like this. Now in practice, the end user links with Vertex as with any other decentralized application like Uniswap or Curve. Its sequencer then handles the aforementioned issues of latency, scalability, and MEV or front running. For any specific trade, Vertex Hybrid Order Book AMM delivers minimum slippage and fast execution, all the while facilitating the trustless nature of DeFi. And at the end of the Vertex line, their ultimate goal is to create a distributed sequencer layer that can serve as a liquidity layer for DeFi protocols across all EVM-compatible chains. Now that we've understood how it all works and the technicalities behind it, let's quickly dive in, bridge some tokens over to the Arbitrum testnet, so we can mint some USDC and actually try out the spot and perpetual trading functions on Vertex's testnet. Now I'm gonna start with a quick overview of the four step process we're gonna to have to go through today. We're gonna to start by getting some ETH onto the girly testnet. There's a few steps involved in this stage. It's not that complicated. We're gonna go through everything together. So make sure you stick around until the end of the video and you'll be fine. Now the second step is gonna be bridging our girly ETH over to Arbitrum Girly because our test capital obviously needs to be in the right network to use it within Vertex. The third step is gonna be actually minting some USDC stablecoin, and we're gonna use the test money that we just bridged over from layer one to layer two. Finally, we're gonna deposit our newly minted USDC onto the Vertex testnet and execute some trades. So let's go ahead. We're gonna to have to start by getting ETH onto the girly testnet, and to do that, we need an Alchemy account. So I go to alchemy.com and I click on get started for free. It asks me to log in, so please put your details in at this stage. And we're gonna log in with our Alchemy account on girlyfaucet.com. The point of doing this with Alchemy is to verify that we're not a bot, so we're not straining the limited resources of the testnet, but we're an actual user. It will ask you at some point for credit card details. You don't actually have to enter them. You can simply skip that step. Now, once I've verified in the girly faucet through Alchemy that I'm not a bot, I'm a real person. So what I'm gonna do now is connect my MetaMask wallet with the girly faucet and get some ETH on there. To do that, I have to open MetaMask. Make sure you're logged in at this point. It's very important that we add the girly test network. We're not trying to get test ETH onto the ETH mainnet. We're gonna put it onto a layer two network. So we add network. We can just type in Girly. We select the test network, which is Girly test network, and we add it. 
I go back to the girly faucet, I should be able to open MetaMask and see that that network has been added to my wallet. There is also a function within MetaMask to show or hide the test network, so make sure that's enabled. Now I switch over to the girly test network. This is very important. I copy my wallet address. I can paste it into girly faucet and ask it to send me ETH. Now this isn't instant, so be patient. When it does eventually work, you'll see some cool animations. We can also follow the transaction process on Etherscan. So the transaction has gone through. Let's check if it was completed in my MetaMask. I can open my wallet and see that I have indeed 0.2 girly ETH deposited in, into my MetaMask wallet. Now the next step is gonna be bridging our girly ETH over to Arbitrum girly. We're gonna use the Arbitrum bridge and essentially what we're doing is we're bridging these tokens from layer one over to layer two. It's very important that we have to make sure we're still on the girly test network here. It might have switched you back to the ETH mainnet. We don't wanna do that because we're not bridging anything from ETH mainnet over to Arbitrum. We're bridging from girly test network. So from here we have to go to the Arbitrum bridge which is at bridge.arbitrum.io. I agree to the terms and conditions to get in and I connect my MetaMask wallet. It's important to once again check that I'm bridging from the right network to the right network. So I open my MetaMask wallet and I see that I'm on the girly test network. Once I've connected my MetaMask and I make sure I'm bridging from the right network, I wanna bridge maybe not all, but about two thirds of the test girly ETH that I have, not all of it to make sure that I can pay for gas. MetaMask notification pops up, so I have to confirm this. Now this isn't instant, as you can see, it takes about 15 minutes. So you might wanna check Etherscan at this point to make sure you're familiar with the entire process. Maybe you wanna scroll back and rewatch it. I can also click on this notification and it shows me exactly the steps that I've just taken. So there you have it. We've bridged our girly ETH from the girly testnet over to Arbitrum girly using the Arbitrum bridge. So now we can mint some USDC on the Vertex faucet. We can use the faucet to mint our stablecoin USDC tokens to deposit them into Vertex. So we're gonna start by launching the Vertex Protocols testnet, which takes us to this page. Step number one, as always, is connecting the wallet. Now that that's confirmed in MetaMask, I have to agree to the terms of use on Vertex testnet. Now what's really clever about the Vertex testnet is it reminds me that I'm not on the right network. So on the top right corner of the screen, you'll see this notification button. I can drop down the menu and it actually lets me switch to Arbitrum Girly, which is where I bridged my tokens over to. I approve. I switch the network and I can see the test ETH that I bridged over into my MetaMask wallet. Once I've confirmed the transaction, I can go over to the top left corner of the website and I wanna enter the faucet. And it gives me a few options of which token I'd like to mint. Now, for the sake of ease, I'm gonna mint some USDC. I click on the mint tokens button and it will let me mint more than once. It's a maximum of 100 USDC per attempt. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this more than once just to make sure I have enough tokens to play around with. So I'm in the testnet faucet, I select USDC from the list of assets, I press mint token, and it opens my MetaMask wallet to confirm the transaction. I connect it, confirm it, pay the gas fees, scroll down. So now I have 100 USDC tokens that I can play around with, but just to make sure I have enough, I'm gonna repeat that process again. So now I have 200 USDC tokens that I can execute some trades with. Okay, so I've gone ahead and minted some USDC. I've deposited them onto the Vertex testnet. Now I'm gonna go over to the spot trading side. Now you might notice a few things when you get in the spot trading side of Vertex's testnet. And on the left-hand side, I can select the trading pair. So for the sake of convenience, I'm gonna put in a market order for 50% of the amount of USDC that I currently have. So I'm depositing 200 minted USDC tokens into the spot wallet. Again, I have to confirm this transaction in MetaMask. Transactions confirmed, and now we have 200 USDC that we can play around with in the spot wallet. I go over to the left-hand side of the screen, and I'm gonna go ahead and execute a market order for convenience. Let's say I want 50 USDC, which is 25% of the funds that I have. I can type that in manually, or I can slide it over to display the amount that I want. I check the price, and I go ahead and press the green buy WETH button. As you would expect, another MetaMask pop-up appears and it asks me to sign and confirm the transaction. 
Now that we've made a trade on our spot wallet, we can go over to the perpetuals trading as well. Using the same top left hand side drop down menu, I select the ETH perpetuals because today I'm trading ETH. And I'll go ahead and make another market order. Let's say this time for 50% of the USDC that I have. I'm opening a long position for Ethereum perpetuals. MetaMask pop-up appears, asks me to sign and confirm the transaction and we can track it at the bottom right hand corner. The transaction is being processed. So now I see my market order has been filled and I wanna also execute a limit order. So I check the price 1520.8 and I'll execute that with 20% of the remaining funds that I have. I sign and the order has been placed. So there we go. I've minted some USDC. I've shifted it over to my spot trading wallet. I've executed two market orders and I've placed a limit order using the perpetuals as well. As we mentioned, Vertex is a turbocharged DEX with lightning fast features and it lets you do some really cool stuff like trading, borrowing and earning without needing to switch back and forth between a bunch of platforms. More importantly, they're bringing the advantages of centralized exchanges to DeFi without the trust issues associated with them. So how would Vertex have prevented the FTX fiasco? Well, among traders, FTX was known for its line of derivative products. That's futures contracts, options, and of course, leverage tokens. Now, because traders could amplify their market positions with leverage, they could also amplify both their gains and their losses. Likewise, it bears keeping in mind that margin trading is a form of leverage trading. But leverage trading isn't limited to just margin trading. After all, Leverage trading includes any trading strategy that uses borrowed capital, which could also come in the form of options or even futures. Now, suffice to say, maintaining the risk of such a complex strategy is extremely important. Vertex facilitates it with the use of cross-margined trading accounts. This means that traders can have a single portfolio to margin across perps, spot, and other money market ventures on Vertex. With a self-custodial wallet access and the underlying decentralized layers of Arbitrum and Ethereum, Vertex ensures ownership of assets. So unlike the FTX fiasco, user funds can't be funneled out to a hedge fund like Alameda Research for gambling purposes. For that to happen, Vertex sequencer as the only off-chain cog would have to be dishonest. But the sequencer can't take custody over users' funds, nor can it forge transactions. Consequently, in the worst case scenario, users' trades would simply fall back to the Arbitrum hosted smart contracts, leaving the funds intact. Now that we're familiar with the ins and outs of Vertex and how the protocol actually functions, how it avoids the pitfalls of centralized exchanges, let us know what your favorite features are in the comments below.